hi everyone. Welcome to today's Medical Alley webinar presented by Medrio. Our discussion today is titled Maximizing Early Stage or Early Phase Clinical Trial Success, Streamlining Data, Technology, and Strategy for Optimal Outcomes. My name is Ben Wagner. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar as we uh, allow everybody to log in this morning. Before we introduce our panel of experts, just a couple of quick notes. Today's discussion is being recorded, so you will receive a link afterward to this discussion. If you would like to rewatch, don't feel like you need to take furious notes. Uh, you'll be able to rewatch, and then you'd also be able to send to a colleague, and we would encourage you to do that. If you have any questions, uh, the Q and A function below is uh, the place to do that. Drop them into that uh, into that section. And we'll have a few minutes here at the end of today's discussion to address them. We have two experts here with us this morning uh, to help navigate the intricate balance of clinical trial data collection, technology integration, and strategic planning, all essential, of course, for achieving FDA approval and securing payer reimbursement. So I am delighted to welcome our panelists here this morning. First, it is my pleasure to introduce Nicole Latimer, the Chief Executive Officer of Medrio. Nicole brings more than 25 years of diverse healthcare leadership experience with a career spanning roles at the advisory board company, which is now part of Optum, and Deloitte Consulting, focusing on population health management and software development. As the CEO of StayWell, she championed lifestyle risk management using behavioral science to improve health outcomes. Nicole excels in designing user-friendly technology that enhances patient and clinician experiences. Also with us here this morning is Amy Longcore, the founder and the chief executive officer of Blue Parachute. Amy brings nearly 30 years of industry experience in clinical trial execution, specializing in data and documentation quality. Her company, Blue Parachute, uh, specializes in providing support for blind data reviews so that sponsors and CROs can identify risks in their clinical trial data. Blue Parachute also provides um, trial master file, remediation services, and monitoring oversight support for all types of clinical trials. Over the years, uh, Amy has seen a lot of examples of what not to do, uh, and she loves bringing quality back to clinical trials. Uh, Nicole, Amy, it is a, a pleasure to, to have you both with us here today for this conversation uh, and for your uh, ability to share your insight and your expertise. So thank you both for being here. Nicole, I will uh, turn it over to you to begin today's discussion. Great. Thanks so much, Ben. I really appreciate it. You know, for those, you know, first of all, thank you to you and Medical Alley for helping us with this. We're really excited to be talking to this particular audience. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Medrio, we do provide e-clinical software. So EDC, ePro, e-consent, and randomization and trial supply management software to help with facilitating clinical trials. Uh, we have been in business for 19 years at this point, and one of our specialties is around medical devices and diagnostics. Uh, we know that moving quickly through a trial is critical, that there is real first mover advantage if you are in the device and diagnostic space. And so our software is specifically designed to help facilitate those trials. Amy, tell us a little bit more about Blue Parachute. Sure, thanks, Nicole. Um, as Ben mentioned, I have been working in this industry since the 1990s. Um, I've been a site monitor, study manager, clinical scientist, and I have experience in so many different therapeutic areas, um, small and large pharma, biotech, um, I have worked in clinical development programs um, with small molecules, devices, autologous and allogeneic uh, stem cells, gene edited programs, and I have had some great experience working with FDA and other regulatory agencies um, for our various programs. Um, recently, I did work side by side with a sponsor who is going through an FDA audit, and I represented the data management um, line function, as well as the trial master file documentation expertise. So my company is Blue Parachute. We're based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we are currently experiencing a heat wave. Um, but I'm looking forward to sharing some stories on this webinar today. Well, great. I think so many people, um, particularly in the Midwest, are experiencing that heat wave. It is a hot day. Um, and what 
I love having the opportunity to talk to people like Amy, right? Amy, you bring so much experience and expertise. I know today you're going to share some of the best practices you've seen. You're going to share some interesting stories of what you've seen with your customers. I'm really looking forward to it. I thought where we could start around the topic is to set some context and really think about what was it like to be collecting data and managing data 30 years ago relative to how has that changed in today's environment? Yeah, so I remember when I started working in the industry in the 1990s, we had case report forms that were paper, trial documents were all paper-based. We routinely monitored clinical trials um, to retrieve data, and those were on those three-part NCR forms, like the, the yellows, the white, and the pink. Uh, we would pull forms and um, send them to our uh, data entry folks um, in-house, and they would double-key enter the data um, into a simple study database. Um, there weren't a lot of technology options for trial processes in the 1990s. We were still actually using, you know, paper airplane tickets to get on flights, and we didn't even have to show our photo ID to travel. Um, we did work with a forms designer um, to design the case report forms. Every time we asked for a data point, we had to show exactly where in the protocol the data was coming from to make sure that it was clearly outlined. Um, team members were not able to just... Um, you know, say, hey, I want to add this data point, add this data point. We didn't add a bunch of data points um, uh, unless there was sufficient rationale and then it was included in the protocol. So we limited, especially early on, um, we did limit the exploratory endpoint data collection. We wanted to get in, get the data and get out and make some decisions. I would also say back then, the key study team members were very close to their clinical trial data, despite the lack of kind of immediate real-time access to a patient data or to the site's data. Our clinical scientists, data managers, medical monitors, they would receive program um, outputs uh, and they would routinely be able to keep an eye on any trends or areas where the sites not, might not be answering the question correctly. Um, I would pick up the phone and call the PI or the site coordinator so that we could best understand a reported adverse event, um, for example. I actually don't remember much, if any, outsourcing that was done in the 90s. Teams were therapeutically aligned in their office. Being therapeutically aligned was important because the entire team, from the data manager to the statistician to the CRA monitor, we would learn about the market competition, the disease, regulatory landscape, challenges with reimbursement. And we could collectively use our teams to design those next studies armed with these lessons learned um, from the previous um, trials. So there was a sense of ownership for that compound among our team members. When our, clinical, when our early clinical studies would fail, we would do a debrief to understand what happened, whether it was just the compound, the device, you know, what we were looking at, or did we not collect the data in a proper manner? Um, queries, let's talk about that. We're gonna mention that over uh, a little bit of the, the meeting today. Queries were generated on illogical data. So there was a handful of edit checks. And when I say a handful, I'm, I'm saying like 25 to 40 data points that we cross-checked. Um, and the queries, the point of the queries was very simple. Was the data logical? Was it within an expected range or not? So when I was a monitor, I would go to the site and I would cross check the entered data because I knew what data points were going to be queried. I might have five or 10 paper queries on the data that I monitored. And I would estimate that on those small number of queries, about 75% of the data would change. So now when we move to the other side of the slide, just Talking about current day, we have so many technology options. We have electronic systems capturing clinical trial data, which in theory will make this data available for sponsors and CROs in real time so we can see what's happening to our investigational devices or our products. We have external sources of data like imaging vendors, labs, patient diaries, randomization data, clinical supply management systems. We have wearable devices 
Um, so, I mean, if you want to collect a data point, there is definitely an electronic system that can get it for you. We can collect a patient's blood glucose 300 times a day if you want that data. We do have more devices and products available on the market than um, previously. So regulatory authorities and payers have access to more post-marketing real-world evidence data, and those drive expectations for data collection of similar products during their clinical development. So real-world evidence is an increasingly important opportunity to support device development, clinical decision-making. The FDA has identified numerous cases where real-world evidence has been accepted to support pre-market authorizations and fulfill some of the post-marketing requirements as well. So outsourcing is also exploded. The estimates now are that more than 75% of all clinical trials have been outsourced to a CRO. Study teams are not co-located, so you may work across time zones for years with a global team without actually meeting anyone face-to-face. We do have a lot of communication, um, text, Slack, virtual Zoom meetings. Um, they're the norm instead of dropping into a colleague's office and asking some quick questions. The teams are also not therapeutically aligned, so there's a different level of experience in a particular area. Sometimes one person supports multiple therapeutic products, and they may not have that depth of experience on a particular disease or what the regulatory pathway challenges are for that you know, particular compound. So ongoing reviews of clinical trial data electronically should be easier, right? But there's just a lot of it. There's a lot of electronic data being generated and it takes a, a, a lot of significant proactive planning and critical thinking to make sure that you're keeping close to your data and monitoring it appropriately. In fact, when our team is hired to help a sponsor or a CRO review their data, oftentimes I hear, oh, we weren't looking at this data. We thought someone else was supposed to be doing that. And we discover after two years of a clinical trial, for example, like no one on the team has been actually reviewing some of this key data. And then to finish up this slide, the number of queries that we have seen generated, let's say, on a phase three protocol has exploded. Um, just last quarter, our team was assisting on a pivotal global oncology study, and there were over 500,000 queries generated in just the study database. A large majority of those queries, the data did not change. So the site coordinators are literally saying data is correct, and the monitors are spending a lot of time closing out these low quality queries. So that's great, Amy. I, you know, we would all, all like to wax nostalgic, right? On what it was like, but we also forget like how time consuming and how expensive mm -hmm. it was. You know, clearly there are some major changes that have happened over time. One of which is the additional data. And so here at Medrio, we actually did some research. Uh, we took a look at 3,800 pilot and phase one studies that we've supported between 2012 and 2023. And what we did is we took that 12 year time period, we split it up into the first six years from 2012 to 2017, and then the second six years from 2018 to 2023. And we compared like what were these averages around these early phase studies. What we found was a significant increase in the number of variables that were collected. Mm -hmm. In that, between those two six year periods, there was a 35% increase in the number of data variables. And so, you know, when you think about it, that's a lot more data, right? A third more data than what we were collecting, even just, you know, kind of recently. What do you think is increasing? What do you think is driving that increase in the number of variables? Yeah, so there's definitely some legitimate increases in data collection. So for new therapeutic areas or um, unmet medical needs, so regulatory agencies might want to understand the burden of the disease what is the natural progression of the disease, for example, because when you understand that, you understand what your endpoints may be. 
So, so regulatory agencies, um, they're, they're very data driven. So they expect that sponsors, CROs um, provide the data so that appropriate endpoints can be identified and they can be measured. So this is legitimate and it does help inform those conversations um, with regulatory agencies at like an, in a phase two meeting, for example. In later phase studies, um, we do see payers, insurance companies asking for more justification, again, on that real world evidence in order to understand the cost of the disease and to support some of their reimbursement conversations. There is also the need to bring in patient advocacy groups and to engage with uh, in the public with stakeholders in order to generate data. There's a, a lot of new AI machine learning opportunities as well. Um, just recently, the FDA did release a plan um, to help facilitate the appropriate development of devices which would incorporate AI and ML. So um, I do feel like those are some legitimate uh, increases to data that you know, probably reflect what you just mentioned, um, what you're seeing at Medrio. I also see companies though with excessive data collection. So this is the nice balance um, that people need to strike as they're working through their development programs. So because of the partnership that I have seen that we have with our clients, I have a lot of examples of way too much data being collected. It's um, too much exploratory biomarker data um, or collection of kind of the same endpoint, but collected three different ways. Um, for example, it may be in a central lab, but also on a, on a case report form. So when you over collect the same data point, now you have a reconciliation issue and you can't really cherry pick which data you want to use. Um, if, if you do double collect the data, I mean, I think you're just causing a little bit more trouble toward the end of your, um, your study, toward your database lock. Uh, maybe your values don't match up and now you have to delay because you need to understand why the data doesn't match up. Um, I've also seen small companies who use a sort of like digital health technology to generate efficacy data, but they never really confirmed with FDA or other regulatory authorities that that, data's, that data from that technology would be accepted. So I think there's some proactive engagement with regulatory authorities um, so that we're, you're on the same page as far as what data is collected from, you know, what systems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think those are the things that can help just make sure that you have a seamless uh, clinical development um, program. So that sounds like a quite a, a fine line to be walking, right? Between I need to collect enough data and the right kind of data relative to regulatory approval or reimbursement or even the ability to go and get my next round of funding, but I don't want to be collecting so much data or inappropriate data or collecting it in a way where I'm double collecting it that causes me to lengthen the time of my trial or to increase the costs associated with it. Exactly. That's, that's hard, right? That's complex. I think another thing that you mentioned I'd love to dive a little bit more into is around going global. I, it struck me that, hey, it used to be we're all sitting in one team in one place talking to each other, really owning something. And now we're all on Zoom talking to each other from all over the world. Tell me a little bit about like, what are those advantages and disadvantages around data collection and monitoring relative to being global? Yeah, so yeah, global teams are great, right? They're closer to the regulatory pathways. They know the landscape in their countries or in their regions. Um, there's different expectations that have been already set up with data collection or data analysis in order to support reimbursement. So you need to make sure you understand and know what those are. Um, there is an expectation in um, Japan, for example, that there's a demonstrated evidence that the data collected was generated on enough Japanese subjects so that they can be sure that the study's safety and efficacy actually represent their demographics. So there's opportunities there when you use global teams for people on that team to say, hey, hey, you guys, we, we, we have to have this number of people um, in certain populations because this is, a, is an expectation. You wanna know those types of things going in as you set up your study for success. 
Um, there's real world evidence, regional and global patient advocacy groups are playing key roles to support regulatory findings. So global teams um, really should know uh, what's going on in their regions, and this can be super helpful. So some challenges, um, sometimes it can feel like there's too many cooks in the kitchen when you work with global teams. There's data collection requests coming in from many functional lines. Um, and usually they're all coming into the data manager. Um, some of these data requests are necessary and some of these are nice to have, but you need to make sure there's some critical thinking going on in your teams and you wanna make sure you drive those discussions um, for you know, the evaluation, critical thinking through the evaluation of the data that is being suggested that you collect. If you over rely, let's say on your outsourcing partner, your CROs to select the CRF data, then I guarantee there's going to be more data collected or there's going to be duplicate data collected. So data collection really needs to be a thoughtful exercise for every clinical trial. And oftentimes I actually don't see a lot of effort being put into this activity at the start of the study. And I think global teams kind of contribute to this, right? People have all these different requests. The, the teams are so spread out. But I do see that sponsors and CROs who proactively manage these data collection requests are usually the ones that are most successful. As far as the routine data monitoring, I also recommend that there is a plan for a data review established with these teams, you know, the global teams prior to the first subject being enrolled. So you can kind of say, all right, this person's going to watch out for some of the real world evidence data coming in. This person's going to be looking at some of the patient advocacy data. So make sure that there is kind of a comprehensive look on what data is being collected who's involved, and then obviously make sure that your protocol is written to support the, um, the, the, the data that you uh, need to collect. Yeah, I really like that advice. It's make sure you're taking advantage of globalization for what it's worth, which is yeah. you want that close knowledge of what data is required, but you got a pressure test on, is it a must have, or is it a nice to have, or is it a, gee, do we even really need it mm -hmm. kind of moment? The last thing I want to talk about here is just, you know, and this is, this is a webinar about efficiency. And so the fact that you're sharing with us that only 2% of queries actually result in a data change is mind numbing, right? That is thousands of hours of work for very little change in outcomes. Why is that? Yeah, so I was surprised at this number myself, Nicole. Um, I did, um, I was looking at some of these online conferences um, during COVID. I was able to kind of um, really dive into some of these, you know, what, where are we? Uh, what's the current landscape with da data collection right now? So there was an SCDM uh, 2020 European conference um, and they looked at phase three clinical trial queries. Um, there, I think there were like, you know, 50 million data points. They looked at the number of queries that were generated on that data. So of the 2 million queries that they looked at, um, only 1.7% of the data actually changed as a result of those queries. So remember when I started off, um, you know, this slide talking about my experience over the last thir uh, 30 years, um, queries are essentially not changing the data now. Before, I, I would estimate that about 75% of the data did change because those queries were picking up some trends or illo you know, illogical data. Excellent. So let's, you know, we've talked about a lot of different things. As you think about a vision of what does efficient data collection and management look like today? What are the, like, key best practices that you would share with this group? Yeah, so there are aspects of clinical trial that have gotten more complicated, but the most successful teams, I would say are teams that do the following things. So number one, do your homework. Know what other data similar compounds, 
devices have been collecting? What regulatory challenges did they have? This is uh, available in the public domain. Team members need to collaborate across functional lines. So your data manager understanding with your medical monitors, with the regulatory experts, what data do you need to critically evaluate your phase of study? So you got to do some homework. The second thing I would say is make sure that your protocol is written to clearly outline those endpoints. And then you build your study database to collect that data. Agree what data will come from external store sources that don't need to be built, um, again, duplicated in your study database. And then the team needs to align on the queries and then the ranges for those queries. You want to be able to choose a technology that allows your teams to be close to your data. Um, and that is a trend that I emphasize with the clients that we work with is, do you understand your data in the current um, situation? Is it easy for you to access your data? And is somebody looking at it proactively, um, like with blinded data reviews, um, in order for you to really understand, you know, have the finger on the pulse of your clinical trial um, all the time? I love it. Three key aspects, right? Do your homework, make sure your protocol represents what you're collecting, and then have those, those systems and technology that help support what you're trying to do. Let's talk about on the next slide, what happens if you don't follow that advice? Like, what does that mean for sponsors if you're not efficient? Yeah, so, you know, I would say that number one, you know, increase in costs, right? So there's a lot of factors that influence the cost of clinical trials. Um, they, they're millions of dollars, right? Millions and millions, almost, you know, a billion dollars for some, uh, some compounds and some studies. For small biotechs um, or device companies in the early development stage, um, performing a clinical trial takes a huge amount of money. So study databases are a component of this. Um, large study databases can be pretty pricey if you choose some of the systems that are out there. There's lots of different options, right? But to critically think through what option best suits your phase of development and what you're trying to do and watch how those prices um, add up. I would also say that clinical trials um, kind of are moving away from this internal management of the clinical research because of all the outsourcing. So although there is a contractual or transactional arrangement with an outsourcing partner to perform trial activities, that license holder is still the sponsor. The sponsor is ultimately responsible for all aspects of the clinical trial and they have to provide a level of oversight to make sure the vendors and partners are performing at a suitable level of quality. Because you want to, at the end of the day, you want to have confidence in that resulting data that you're generating. Um, in that outsourcing model, the, the sponsors internally may heavily rely on their outsourcing partners to manage their data. So again, um, you know, as I just mentioned, that puts the sponsor a little further away from their assets clinical data. I also see something um, that I've noticed over the last decade, especially, is that there is this industry-wide over-promotion. So when I was working at Pfizer 20 years ago, we moved up the corporate ladder slowly. Um, our development and our experience on the work that we were doing was prioritized. We did not have a lot of title upgrades um, if you were a vice president, you had 25, 35 years of experience in the industry. So I have been interacting a lot of times with vice presidents who have less than 10 years of um, industry experience. And that's really tough, right? Because you have limited experience, but now you're supposed to be leading these, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three programs. And, um, you know, you don't have enough experience to help inform your decision-making for the, the programs. They just haven't seen enough trials go off the rails in order for them to be truly able to spot the issues before they become too big to handle. 
So, you know, these are the, these are the, the companies that call me up and they say, Hey, I'm, uh, I need some help. Um, I've got six months to go to my database lock and, um, I'm a little worried about what's going on. So, uh, one other thing about this, um, industry wide over promotion, um, I have experience where with one company is on the metrics that maybe an outsourcing um, vendor may provide back to the trial sponsors. We had a sponsor client, for example, that was receiving a traffic light style metric for their trial master file data. Um, for three years, they've been hearing green, everything's green, everything's good. Um, which obviously, you know, to the people at the company meant, okay, there's no issues. It wasn't until we asked the CRO how they were defining those metrics that we realized the TMF had actually almost 300,000 missing documents. Um, and that this was, you know, obviously a long story, but the CRO had not been creating placeholders for those documents, but their metrics, the bottom line here, and this applies across the board to lots of vendors, is the metrics that were being provided to the sponsor actually did not reflect the reality. And having that critical thinking, that industry experience, because you've actually learned so much from you know, failures, um, you learn so much from your experience to help inform your decision-making at, you know, at a vice president level, um, those are the things that help, help you get stronger. But I do see an industry-wide over-promotion, so you just don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's so hard, right? Because you're thinking as a sponsor, I'm going to manage my costs effectively, right? I'm not going to build expertise in-house. I can't afford to. I don't have the cash runway to do that. So I've got, I'm going outside into the industry to find experts. And you've got to carefully select those experts, as you said, really, because you're relying on them to bring the right tools, to bring the right metrics, to fully inform you of what is going on. And I know sometimes when you outsource, you, you have to consider some things around like, what are those assumptions that you have to make? What do you need to know if you're a sponsor who is thinking about outsourcing data management? Yeah, so, you know, in, in pulling some suggestions or ideas based on my experience, I would say that sponsors need to minimize bad assumptions when considering, data, considering systems for their data collection. Some of these are listed on the slide. So, you know, big EDC systems don't actually mean, mean higher quality data. A lot of times you don't need all the bells and whistles from these larger systems. You need to choose a validated database that is easy to set up, easy to modify during the study, um, easy for sites to access, for CRAs to navigate, and you don't need to overpay for a big, fancier system. Bigger EDC systems also do not provide data quality. Data quality does not depend on your EDC system. The studies that meet database lock timelines with high quality data are usually the ones where the collected data is minimized, right? Critically thought through, queries were thoughtful, and then multifunctional data reviews were performed throughout the study. So for sponsors or CROs, um, if you're on this webinar today, challenge your study teams to choose intuitive, easy to use, fit for purpose study databases. The final protocol also should outline the data and endpoints, but remember, EDC systems are built by humans and they're tested by humans. I worked with a CRO client last year whose data manager um, admitted that they use the same CRFs and edit specs as another sponsor study, but nobody realized that there were queries going out with the wrong investigational product name on it 
until a year into the study when a, a site monitor brought that to everyone's attention. There, there are some efficiencies that can be done, but yeah, there's also some egregious examples where th people are just building databases, grabbing stuff from a, a, a similar, what they think to be a similar study um, and making things in your database that maybe you're, you're not even aware that's going on. Um, also queries, right? So queries generated on your study data should be critically evaluated. Just don't go with any type of standard query practice without having the study team review um, those edit checks and confirm the accuracy, confirm that that's a value added query to go out. Uh, I just in the last month looked at a lot of queries that were uh, generated and the queries are, have a lot of misspellings. They're, they're written in English, but they're, the sentence structure is very awkward. So there's confusion on what the site needs to do to make that query go away, right? They're, they're, not, they're not understanding what the question is. Um, I've seen queries that are very, mis they're telling the site very directed queries to delete data, but there's no rationale. Obviously, sometimes, oh, this data should be deleted, but you, you need to provide a rationale there. Um, I see single queries written about multiple data issues, so it's very confusing what the sites need to do in order to get the data cleaned and the query closed out. So, I also think that there are way too many 100 page documents supporting clinical trials now. Site coordinators, site monitors, um, they're not digesting the contents of a 94 page case report form completion guidelines when they're working on 14 other clinical trials. There is a, there's a lot of documents trying to cover every aspect, every situation of a clinical trial, but I'm fairly certain that most people on the trial have not had time to read and understand the information. When it comes to your data, the sites and CRAs need to understand what the key data points are and how to capture this very intuitively without having to read a 94 page document. And I think finally, most of the sponsors we work with, they assume that for as much money as they're paying, somebody is looking at their data. So this is kind of a, a very common misperception. And uh, this is the worst assumption a company can make. Your data is the most important asset you have. So you want to make sure you stay close to it and you set up, you choose the right technologies that allow you to do that. Excellent. I think there's a great, great takeaways for sponsors who are thinking about outsourcing. Let's turn to the next slide and really talk about that streamlining of data, right? Because your, your clear point is you don't just buy technology and expect that technology is going to create high quality data. There's critical thinking that goes into it, right? You have to select what kind of data do I want to collect? So, right, we, we talked at the beginning about this 35% increase in the number of variables. What are some of those best practices on, you know, what, why, why is it important to think about the clinical, clinical trial data that you are collecting? And what are the risks if you don't collect the right data? Mm -hmm. So, I cannot, I think that's the one key takeaway from this um, presentation is that your assets data set is as vital as the actual asset itself. So um, this, this was instilled in me, you know, when I started my career back in Pfizer, the medical monitor of the trial that I was working on, she handed me a stack of papers at the end of our phase two trial. And it really was the programmed output. So the TLS, the tables, the listings, the figures that came from our, our, our final study database. And she said, Amy, this is essentially what we got for $20 million. So I didn't forget this because you spend all this money on these trials, but you essentially, what you're spending on your money on is to get the data you need to make appropriate strategic decisions. So the money you're spending on the clinical trials essentially is supporting of data collection. Your assets data drives your decisions. If your data is dirty, inconclusive, missing, uh, illogical, then those key decisions 
cannot be made with high confidence. There's also risks of poor data. Um, so in the orange box to the right, we list some of the possible risks from suboptimal data collection. So I look at it this way. I mean, if I could bring it, distill it down. A product, a device, it's gonna work or it's not gonna work. It's gonna have an appropriate risk benefit or it's not. Our goal in this industry is not that every product is approved. Our goal should be that the device that the product tells us by its data whether it's working or not. So if that data is inconclusive because of subpar data collection um, or the clinical team did not get in front of perhaps some data trends that were going in a different area, um, then there's gonna be delays in database lock um, and there's gonna be last minute issues and then we're all gonna lose. So, Obviously, if you are looking to partner with an asset, um, this could affect your potential investors, your partnership alliances, your entire company's strategic focus is going to change based on data. Your company's reputation could be negatively affected. I've seen clinical sites actually refusing to participate on a clinical trial because of the EDC system that the sponsor or CRO chose. I've seen clinical site budgets that are increased because of the EDC system or the CRO partner chosen. It's kind of this, the, the sites are calling it this nuisance fee. Um, so they, you know, I think looking at the risks of core data, if you have end users who are not thrilled about your data collection system, they are not going to enter the data in real time. They're not going to respond to queries. And now you're paying them more because of the nuisance fee. So I think there's um, obviously challenges and risks in core data. And if you can, def if you can kind of Think about what those are for your particular situation and set up a plan and bring in the appropriate key stakeholders in your team. You will set up yourself for success. Right. I completely agree. Data is critical, right? You can set yourself up for success, but it's hard. We talked earlier about that fine line you have to walk between just enough data to be successful in what you're going after and not enough data, or, or sorry, too much data where you actually overly complicate your trials. What can sponsors and even CROs do to help streamline the data that they're capturing? Yeah, so here's just a few things. Um, you know, obviously there's lots of different, you know, possibilities and strategies and suggestions, but I think, you know, when I was thinking through what I would recommend as some, um, you know, strategies to consider where you could streamline your data collection, you could optimize your data collection. One of the first thing is just understand the data importance by phase of study. Phase one, phase two, phase three, phase. What are you trying to do? What's your point? Are you are you developing data for uh, a business strategy? For example, if you're hoping to be acquired, um, due diligence. You want to make sure that you have strong data to support whatever that you know strategic. Um, business strategy is um, and the phase of study that you're doing. So again, it's kind of like do your homework and align with why you're collecting this data and make sure your entire team is aware of those. The protocol, your clinical protocol is your roadmap. This outlines your primary, secondary endpoints. So you want to make sure that is written with your key stakeholders involved not all of the data collected is equally important, but your most important critical variable data is your, is your endpoint, primary, secondary. During the study conduct, you do wanna make sure your data is cross-checked and logical with other data points. So doing your homework, asking questions, making sure you're really critically aligned with you know, the, the rationale and the reasons for your trial is gonna be super important. You need to take a look at your queries, right? So queries should be thoughtfully written and explain to the site why the data might be incorrect. I highly recommend involvement with your biostatistician, mm -hmm. programmers, 
data management, monitoring teams, um, so that everyone kind of understands these. I, I do see us very much siloed in different, you know, functional lines, and that does not help your study nor your data collection. Um, and obviously it kind of goes without saying, but once your database is locked, you shouldn't be unlocking to modify data. You will take a statistical hit on that, um, but you open up your question, your company to questions about bias um, on the study results. So again, staying close to your data over the course of your trial, collecting the right data, making sure your, um, your team is aware of those are all key strategies in making sure you set yourself up for success. Excellent advice. You also mentioned that, you know, it's not just, hey, let's streamline that data. Part of it is not expecting your EDC or your data capture sy system to be the source of, you know, the highest quality data. It alone is not creating the highest quality data. Tell us a little bit about what sponsors should be thinking about as they think, as they select an EDC. So I always say you want to pick us a, a system that is intuitive and user friendly. So what does this mean? Well, you need a sy system that makes it simple for the sponsor or your CRO teams to stay close to the data. Can you easily run on-demand reports in real time to support data review activities? Can you find queries quickly? Is it simple to pull data sets for your output programmed, um, you know, tables, listings, figures from your um, programmers? Um, an intuitive EDC system allows for more focused time on data entry, monitoring, and it really is less frustration for your PIs, sites, uh, site coordinators, um, your site monitors. I work very closely with our medical monitor on a few uh, phase two trials. Um, we, use, we use your system, um, Nicole Medrio is great. Um, so he has access to the database and he can cross check the data and it saves the team time because he gets in there and it's very simple. So I always say if this medical monitor can do it, you know, that is really the goal. Um, you, he's close to the data, he's able to ask questions um, and the, the, um, it's, a, it's a really great thing to do that. So it needs to be intuitive. Um, you wanna choose a fit for purpose system that is intuitive to the end users. So again, site coordinators, um, PIs, you want to um, make sure that you have a reasonable requirement for system training. Mm -hmm. I had to do a 10 hours of EDC training for this, um, this other system. Um, it was a very expensive uh, system for a phase two trial, but I had to get do 10 hours of training in order to even get into the system to, to perform a user acceptance testing. So the UAT is really important to make sure your database is validated. But um, I mean, you need to ensure that it's, uh, you know, the UAT is is intuitive. You want you, you want more people on your study team to participate in the UAT because then you can identify more issues um, and you can test the queries that are getting um, you know flagged and and, and um, triggered before your database goes live. Um, I also recommend to the clients that I work with that they need to have a simple setup. Um, you want to make sure that if you oh, get, say, oh my gosh, during the study, I need to add a couple more variables. How easy is it for you to execute a mid-study update? Mm -hmm. um, and how easy is it for you to have those PIs sign off at the CRFs at the end of the day? So um, they need to be simple and easy to experience. Um, and then I think finally, a critical evaluation is cost. Um, every dollar that small companies, big companies, whatever, every dollar that you can save allows your board of directors, allows your CEOs, allows your clinical strategy team to allocate more funds for additional studies. And anytime you can do additional studies to generate data for your asset, that's the most important thing to do. So I really feel like you have to look at the value um, and that's going to be an important driver for, you know, when I suggest, um, you know, what EDC system should I use? Right. Excellent. So if we wrap it all up, you know, we've shared a ton of information today. If we were going to sum it up in like a couple pieces of advice, 
what would you share with sponsors? Um, my number one thing, I think I've said this a few times here, if there's one final takeaway, it's that your clinical trial data is your most important asset. So you need to stay close to it. You should choose a system that is fit for purpose, intuitive, supports data entry, and also allows the study team to stay close to your trial data. If you feel as though you, you know, maybe you came late to the program um, and your clinical trial and you feel like, oh my gosh, we may have some problems um, and I'm not really sure about my data, um, definitely you need to reach out and contact people in the industry who might be able to help you. Um, there are lots of different things that could derail your clinical trial, and you don't want to save those to the end. You don't want to save those to right before database lock because then you're not going to meet your timelines and you're going to have a lot of hiccups that were proactively, had you managed those, maybe wouldn't be um, you know, sneaking in there at the end of the day. But don't wait until database lock to start looking at your data. It really needs to be you know, thoughtfully, um, you know, plan and, you know, just be honest with yourself. I, I remember coming into one client last year and I just asked the, the medical monitoring team, I said, hey, how many serious adverse events have you had? And they kind of looked at me and I said, well, you don't have to give me the exact number. Just is it less than 50 or is it more than 300? And they all kind of looked at each other and they said, I don't know. And so for the medical monitors of these trials to say they don't know whether it's less than 50 or greater than 300, that's an issue. So again, key takeaway, stay close to your data. There's nothing more important than your data and that's your responsibility. Excellent. Well, I think we, uh, you know, thank you, Amy, for sharing your stories and your advice. Really appreciate it. I think we might have some time for questions. We do. And we've got a couple of really uh, good questions here. And first, Nicole and Amy, thank you both for your for your insight. I think it's been a great discussion so far. A uh, first question comes in here from uh, Jennifer, and she asks, I'm curious if you're finding technologies to better access and analyze clinical data, patient history or records. Yeah, I mean, I can try. I mean, Nicole, I could jump in here and try that. So, you know, this is an emerging, um, this is an emerging topic, right? So I think everybody's interested in how do we do this better? And can we use machine learning? Can we use AI? You know, because if they could look at the patient's charts, and then they could just fill the data in, that could save a lot of steps. Um, but I'm seeing um, sites that are trying to do this or sponsors who are trying to do this. And there are issues. You cannot remove the human element. So I would recommend, Jennifer, I mean, it's a great question, and I think we'll get there. When I look and see what we've done over the last 30 years, there's definitely been some improvements, right? And technology is a big one. But I don't think we're ever going to remove humans. Um, and I think those systems need to be tested and then I also need to make sure that um, companies are proactively having these conversations with payers, with uh, regulatory authorities, because you don't want to get to having a conversation with them when you've collected data in a manner that they're like, oh, yeah, I don't I don't trust the data. You need to make sure your data is validated. You have data integrity. You can trust the data. And some of these new systems, um, I don't know, have been pressure tested enough for me to say, oh, yeah, this is this is the one to, to do. So, Nicole, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we see the ability to integrate in with EHRs. We see the ability to integrate with devices and sensors. But the key thing that we've been talking about in this entire webinar, which is you have to know what are the specific pieces of data you want to bring in is still relevant, right? Like you could bring in the entire chart for the patient, but then you're creating a, a lot more data that you then have to monitor and cleanse. It's, so, so it's not just, can I get these technologies and bring the information in? It's really thinking selectively around what is the specific information I want to be able to import into the EDC. Mm -hmm. And Nicole, kind of following up on that, this is a good uh follow up here from Warren and just, uh, you know, as we have a few minutes left here, I'd also encourage any of our participants to put the, put your question in the Q&A function as well. Um, Warren asks, are there any good lessons yet about prompting AI to curate an excess of data? 
Well, I would say the operative word there is yet, right? We are still early on, um, particularly with generative AI being used. Um, what, I, what I am seeing is, are four critical use cases for AI. Um, the first is around submission content writing. So more folks are saying, let's have uh, generative AI take a look at our data, do some of that critical writing. But as Amy pointed out, there is then the human element of, and humans come in and review it and edit it and refine it to make it appropriate. Um, second use case is around regulatory intelligence. I, you know, I, every webinar I've ever been on when we talk about globalization, is the fact that there are rules and regulations that vary across different countries. And so being able to use AI to very quickly understand, if I'm gonna have a trial in 50 different countries, what are the differences in regulations across those 50 so that I can work within my technology, work within my trial to accommodate those different regulations? Third case study is around what we call smart data management. And this is really um, using machine learning to help with understanding the bounds of the data. Uh, I think Amy described uh, a little bit before around having ranges in your queries that are too tight and generating an excessive number of queries because of these tight ranges. Uh, we're seeing people who then apply the machine learning to say, okay, is this a matter of my range was too tight or is it really an aberration in the data that I need to investigate? And we're also seeing uh, machine learning applied in smart data management against potential fraud. Mm -hmm. I, I think we probably all know that uh, too many even numbers uh, is like if, it, if there are more than 50% of your data ends in an even number, there could be some fraud associated with it, right? Somehow we as humans like to make up even numbers as opposed to odd numbers. And so doing those kinds of checks, uh, helping to, to narrow down around where might we have problems with the data. And then the fourth is uh, trial performance. And this is really looking at ensuring that the protocol is being followed. And so uh, watching the activities within the systems and should activities be out of order, should activities not be completed, being able to flag, but of course that also then requires human intervention. So it's more of a proactive flagging system as opposed to resolving some of the issues. We've got, it looks like, Maybe time for one more question here. Um, and the question that we've got here in the Q&A is, what is driving the over-promotion trend? I Your can, thoughts, Amy? Yeah, I have thoughts on this. Um, so it's a great question. And I've thought about that and talked about it with some of my colleagues as well. So a couple things. First of all, people um, are jumping around from job to job, especially in certain areas. Boston's a big one. Um, San Diego's another one. They're, they're just jumping around from job to job. One of the things that is very enticing for someone is to leave a job at, uh, you know, associate director level and actually be able to go up to a VP level. So I think those kind of floating out, you know, these, um, uh, you know, maybe titles that are beyond their, you know, 30 years of experience or whatever, um, I think is, is something I've seen. Um, I don't necessarily think it's bad. I mean, I think that's, it's whatever it's business, right? So you're wanting, you're trying to get the best people at your company. And I get that, but what's hard is those people at VP levels have a lot of burden to make sure that they have enough experience to be able to direct their ship in the right direction. Um, 
So I think there's, you know, enticing the, what's driving it, enticing to get people to their company. Um, and that does entice somebody if they say, hey, I can leave this, I'll make a little bit more money, but heck, I'm a VP. Uh, I think people are taking those type of jobs. So people do not stay in the same job um, for years and years. And there's a lot of jumping around that's going on because they do get some experience and they go to the next company, go to the next company. So definitely getting a title bump is um, attractive. Um, I don't know that it's always good for the clinical trial, but you know, that's, that is the trend that we do see. Yeah. And we would, we would back that up. What we're seeing is, you know, we're, we're at historically low unemployment levels. I understand economically we've had issues, but like 3.7% unemployment is still historically low. And so getting great talent is tough. Uh, bringing them in at a higher level and a better title. It's a great way to recruit. Right. Well, I think that's a, a great place to stop here. Um, I want to thank each of our panelists, Nicole Latimer and Amy Longcore, both for your time today. Um, really great discussion. And I want to remind our, our panelists or our participants, excuse me, who are watching, we will send a follow-up email with this link to this discussion. So if you'd like to rewatch any parts of it or send to a colleague, we would encourage you um, to do that. So uh, one other note here uh, within Medical Alley next week is Tap the Cash, my one plug for the day uh, at Surly Brewing Company uh, in Minneapolis, June 25th from 4 to 6.30 p.m. Registration is now open, so we'd love to see all of you there. So uh, one more thanks uh, to Nicole and to Amy for being here and uh, and for your, for your expertise today. Thank you both. Thank you, Ben. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, all. Uh, that is it for this Medical Alley webinar. Uh, I'm Ben Wagner. Have a great day.